Welcome. I'm Christopher Starr from the Weill Cornell Medical Center, and with me today is my good friend, John Kenalopoulos from uh, Athens, Greece, of course, a little bit of time in New York City as well, trained in the, in the States, practiced mostly in Athens now, uh, but you still have an office in Manhattan, okay. and you're there part-time. One of the reasons, I think, uh, that you left the States and practiced full-time in Athens is simply because we're so far behind the times when it comes to embracing new technology, FDA process, et cetera. Would you agree with that? Well, I think it was partly people <laughs> like you practicing in New York City, so <laughs> not much yeah, from there. You're real scared of me, yeah. But uh, you're absolutely right, uh, Chris, and I thank you for having me. Um, I, for long, uh, endeavored between practicing both in the U.S. and uh, mm -hmm. going out to Europe for a week, and it was soon that I got so... Uh, so interested in all the new technology and all yeah. the uh, the new uh, research work you could do that uh, I was sold. I just I just yeah. moved there. And now you are truly on the cutting edge of lots of things. Cross linking, however, is really um, you know the dichotomy between Europe and and the U.S. When it comes to cross linking, is pretty dramatic. Yes. It's dramatic. Yes. Not only do we have most of us have zero experience with cross linking for just treating you know keratoconic patients. Um, you're two, three, four steps ahead of us in that regard. Now you're using cross-linking, uh, not to treat keratoconics and ectasia, but actually refractive and normalize for refractive purposes and also in sort of high-risk eyes with LASIK to prevent ectasia. Yes. And we can talk, you know, we don't have that much time, but I'd love to... You know, tap into your brain a little bit about some of the things that you're doing. Um, a very interesting study that I just saw of yours, and you, of course there's one every month, it seems like, uh, with your name on it, um, is the looking at these sort of higher myopes doing regular LASIK, doing LASIK extra, which is LASIK com com combined with cross-linking at the time of surgery, and but interestingly looking at the epithelial remodeling after surgery, and you want to Talk a little bit about yes, that. It's um, and thank you for bringing it up. We have uh, being able to work with epithelial maps in an easy way because, of course, it was high frequency ultrasound right. uh, that uh, was the golden standard and brought epithelial to our attention as uh, cornea surgeons. Have, be, having an easy way to to see it with the uh, new cornea CT uh, devices, mm -hmm. we are uh, we have done a lot of work and look at that normal eyes, dry eyes, and how the epithelium remodels after a lot of surgery, especially LASIK. Yeah. And I think that's a very important point because we are we tend to look at refraction and cornea topography, and I feel after I've, what I've seen that are, they are both very much affected mm -hmm. by differences in epithelial remodeling. Uh, then we're looking at how uh, the epithelium responds long-term in LASIK eyes, and we saw that the higher the amount of myopia corrected in LASIK, the more uh, irregularity in the uh, epithelium within the cent central six millimeters of the cornea. Right. So that starts to become significant because, number one, it obviously affects quality of vision. It has to affect refraction, yeah. especially when we're looking at mesopic and scotopic conditions. And we're endeavoring in the area that it may have a story to tell us about cornea stability. Mm. Um, uh, so uh, in order to put that to test, we compared side-by-side uh, -side a very large cohort. Uh, this is about 100 and something patients. Yeah. Uh, of normal LASIK that would be done anywhere worldwide, uh, right. femtosecond LASIK, uh, myopia is up to minus nine, and then LASIK extra patients. Obviously, the LASIK extra patients are patients that were a little bit higher in myopia. But when we, uh, when we stratified the data according to degrees of myopia corrected, uh, the differences after we leave six diopters and go to six to seven, and seven to eight, and eight to, eight to nine are very significant. So this tells us a story that either LASIK extra stabilizes corneas and makes corneas uh, behave differently, thus the epithelium as well, which is the plastic cover, right. rather the cover of the cornea that has a lot of plasticity, right. or the cross-linking in those eyes does have some effect in the epithelial repopulation that's irrelevant to the biomechanics. It's so, I mean, it's just simply fascinating. It's fascinating. Uh, but you, when you apply the, the do you apply the uh, riboflavin under the flap uh, on the stromal bed and then put the flap back down, or is it well, at transepithelial? Uh, right. The the technique that we've uh, described and we still follow, though with more advanced technology, with having the Avidro uh, devices mm -hmm. available to us, is we're trying to uh, instill riboflavin in the residual stroma, 
and avoid any exposure of the flap to the riboflavin. Okay. Because the concept is that once you uh, reposition your flap, as you would uh, at the end of any LASIK procedure, you would have minimal uh, exposure within the flap of riboflavin. So mm -hmm. by exposing them the eye to very high fluence, this is 30 milliwatts, uh, this is uh, 10 times the original fluence described uh, uh, in Dresden uh, about 15 years ago, it will go through the epithelium, through Bowman's, through the uh, most of the flap, and reach the underlying stroma soaked with riboflavin and get the cross-linking effect there. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's so, but it's, that's why it's even more interesting that putting it on the stromal bed and then putting the flap back down, that it, it does have this effect, this impact on the epithelial thickening and remodeling right. after surgery when it's not actually right affecting the epithelium directly. Well, the the data we have, and of course we're waiting other studies to, to validate them further, is that uh, for hyperopa, for instance, we don't treat hyperopic patients without cross-linking anymore uh, because we have shown mm -hmm. uh, in this meeting uh, three years ago that the difference is dramatic when you look at those eyes a year after. Yeah. So it may not be uh, such a unstable thing treating hyperopes with uh, LASIK if you can stabilize them biomechanically. And I think uh, all these pieces of the puzzle that we're putting together, epithelial changes, uh, refractive stability in high myopes and high probes, uh, uh, you know, point to the same direction that this may be a very helpful adjunct. Yeah, wow, absolutely. What about surface ablation? Have you done any? Uh, we, we've combined it with surface ablation, especially in eyes that are on suspicion for ectasia, some from first keratoconus, uh -huh. we see a lot of those patients in, uh, in Southern Europe. And, of course, we've uh, treated uh, a, a huge cohort, probably the largest uh, globally, of uh, combining a therapeutic uh, surface ablation, a very irregular uh -huh. surface ablation to remodel the surface and keratoconic eyes with high fluence crosslinking as well. And uh, we find that up to this moment the most effective way to visually rehabilitate these eyes. Yeah, I mean, it would seem to me that the epithelial remodeling would be even more affected by crosslinking in combination with PRK than with LASIK, but I don't know. What do I You're know? absolutely right. <laughs> this is uh, you just gave out uh, our uh, our uh, next project, which is uh, PRK. You're absolutely right, uh, Chris. The the uh, the PRK eyes that we studied with the OCT show a dramatic difference in how the epithelium remodels more so than LASIK. Interesting. So it may be uh, a key modulator there as well. Interesting. Um, in our last minute, um, Pixel, uh, which is using cross-linking uh, strategically in a cornea to affect myopia, hyperopia, astigmatism. Mm -hmm. Are we all going to be doing that in 10 years and are the lasers going to go out of business or? It's hard to say. <laughs> it's hard to say. I mean, I, I, I'm, 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 I've learned through the years to be very modest as far as uh, promoting new things. Yeah. Uh, I, I can say that uh, we have now uh, nine months clinical experience. It's very impressive. It, it only relates to small amounts of uh, right. uh, corrections like adopter, myopia, yeah. adopter, hyperopia. Where it's a key is uh, tr trying to treat some irregular astigmatism, uh, some mild astigmatism, and uh, in the months that we've studied this, it's, it looks very promising, and it, it possibly addresses a huge part of the population that we never think about doing refractive surgery yeah. on. Right. That's that really cataract good. patient that has 0.75 diopters of astigmatism that yeah. you know you can help, et cetera. What's that whole risk-benefit ratio? An intraocular exactly. surgery to correct a, half of a diopter might not be worth it, but to put a couple of drops of exactly. riboflavin on a cornea and a shine a light, low Ex risk. Exactly. Yeah. The morbidity with this procedure for the patients is, is, is dramatically minimal yeah. than what we're used to seeing. Well, John, of course, I could talk to you for literally hours and hours and hours, but we're out of time. Uh, but I want to thank you for coming, and we'll do this again Oh, thank, thank you, Christopher. It's always a pleasure. And I want to thank you for watching.